All right, it's seven o'clock. Let's get this party started, folks. So welcome to our August meeting of the Central Florida Astronomical Society. And if you're watching this and you're not a member already, for some strange reason, what are you waiting for? If you join CFAST, you'll have access to our private events and dark sky viewing locations, access to our loaner telescope program. If you want to borrow a telescope and see what it's all about before you uh, decide to buy one of your own. We also have a vibrant online community through the group's IO platform. And the coolest thing, we have quarterly meetings at the Seminole State Planetarium. What is more awesome than an astronomy club meeting in a planetarium? Uh, your membership also comes with Astronomical League membership, which includes the quarterly Reflector magazine. And you can just feel good about it because we are a nonprofit 501c3 organization and 100% volunteer powered. If you're interested in joining, please head over to CFAST.org and you'll see information about our membership plans there. Today, we've got a good lineup. Uh, we're going to start with Dr. Joshua Wynn from Princeton talking about exoplanets and his book, The Little Book of Exoplanets. And after that, our board member at large, Mark Pernal, will come on and talk a little bit about the upcoming board elections. You're going to be voting on that in October, and it's coming up soon. So if you're interested in running for the board, now is the time to think about that. We'll also have our usual club news of upcoming events, and we'll wrap things up, as always, with our astrophotography and sketching showcase. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, Joshua Wynn would like to hear from you live. So if you have questions during the presentation, just just holler, chime in, unmute yourself, right. yell. And... Um, or if you want to be a little bit more orderly, you can use the raise hand action there at the bottom of the screen there, and uh, I'll chime in for you. If you do want to wait till after the presentation, that's cool too. It's up to you. But um, we do have an intimate group here, so let's go ahead and take advantage of it and uh, have a little chit-chat, make it more interactive. However, during the meeting, please do stay muted if you're not talking or asking a question. Uh, for some weird reason, uh, the option on Zoom to automatically mute people when they join is not on. So uh, please do make take a moment to double check and make sure the mute button is on so we don't listen to whatever you're saying to your significant other in the background through the whole meeting. And with that, allow me to introduce our main speaker, Dr. Joshua Wynn. Josh Wynn's research goals are to explore the properties of planets around other stars, to understand how planets form and evolve, and to make progress on the age-old question of whether there are other planets capable of supporting life. His group uses optical and infrared telescopes to study exoplanetary systems, especially those in which the star and planet eclipse one another. He was a participating scientist in the NASA Kepler team and is a co-investigator and architect of the ongoing Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite Mission, also known as TESS. Yes. Over the years, he and his group have also pursued topics in stellar astronomy, tidal evolution, planetary dynamics, radio interferometry, gravitational lensing, and photonic band gap materials. And he's also the author of The Little Book of Exoplanets, which I just got here, and I can't wait to dive into it. Uh, it's not so little. There's a lot of information in here. So if you want a lot more depth on exoplanets after this talk, do check it out and pick up a copy. It's a nice book and very well written. And let me hand it off to our guest, Dr. Joshua Wynn. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, Frank, and thank you everybody for tuning in tonight and uh, expressing your desire to learn a little bit more about our corner of the universe and about exoplanets. So I'm going to go ahead and launch my slideshow. And Frank, can you confirm that everything looks okay? You can see all is good. Field. Okay, let me just rearrange my window now so I can see what I need to see. So I, I really appreciate you, you coming out tonight and, and, uh, and learning a thing or two about exoplanets. In case you don't know that term, why don't we just start there? You have all certainly thought about exoplanets, whether or not you know that particular word, because I know that you've been outside somewhere on a clear dark night and you've looked up at the stars and you know that each one of them is just as powerful and luminous as our sun, just very, very far away. And so you have wondered, which of those stars out there have planets? And are, are any of them like the Earth? You have been thinking about exoplanets. An exoplanet is a planet, but it orbits another star, not the sun, somewhere else in the galaxy. One of the fun things about this field is that this question of whether other stars have planets has been around for centuries. You, know, you, can, you can look back to antiquity and find writers wondering about the possibility of other worlds. But it's only been about 25 or 30 years that we've had actual scientific evidence for the planets that orbit these distant suns. 
And so during that very long interval between the question being interesting and the question being answerable, we've had a lot of time to imagine those worlds. And especially in science fiction, in its, in its modern incarnation, we are invited by science fiction to imagine worlds like the worlds of Star Wars. One of my favorites is uh, the planet Mustafar, which shows up in the third film. This is a planet whose surface is covered with lava, and it's the, the stage for this climactic lightsaber duel. Um, even more famous is another Star Wars world, Tatooine which is famous because it orbits two stars. And so Luke Skywalker can look toward the horizon and see a double sunset. One of the things I wanna share with you tonight is that we actually know of exoplanets orbiting other stars that share the key properties that make these two science fiction worlds so interesting. So I wanna take you to the frontier where science meets science fiction and show you how we know, how we can make these deductions and what else we've learned about exoplanets. First though, before we get carried away with all of those science fiction worlds, let's just remind ourselves about normal planets, the planets that do share our sun. So there are eight of them, and here's a picture that illustrates their relative sizes. Uh, we have four little planets, mostly made of solid material, rock, and metal, and that's Mercury and Venus and the Earth and Mars. And then we have two really huge planets, Jupiter and Saturn, that are almost entirely made of hydrogen and helium, although they do have other heavier elements as well. And then we have two sort of mid-sized planets. These are sometimes called the ice giants, Uranus and Neptune, each of which is about four times the size of the Earth. And they do have a lot of hydrogen and helium in addition to having rock and metal and other heavier elements. So these are the planets of the solar system and their relative sizes. Now to see where they are located in the solar system, uh, we have to zoom out quite a bit. So let's, let's take a look at a map of the solar system as viewed from above that shows the orbits now on a true scale. And long before planets were understood, and long before the physics of planetary motion was understood, um, some patterns became obvious in the properties of the solar system. One of them is that the orbits of the planets around the sun are nearly circular. They're not exactly circular. They're actually ellipses, if you look very closely. But to first approximation, they're very nearly circular. The second pattern is more obvious if we change our perspective. And instead of viewing the solar system from above, we look at it from the side. So if we do that, we notice that the orbits are nearly aligned with each other. That is the plane that is traced out by each planetary orbit aligns pretty well with all the other orbital planes to within a few degrees. The third pattern, which didn't really become obvious until the invention of the telescope and the realization that the planets had different characters and different compositions is that the rocky planets, those four small planets, they're all near the sun. They're in very much the inner part of the solar system. Whereas the gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are much farther from the sun. By the way, you, you probably are aware that Pluto doesn't obey any of these patterns. It is a small rocky planet, very far from the sun, its orbit is not especially circular, and it is not aligned with the orbits of the other planets. That's okay. As scientists, we know what to do about a situation like this. We simply redefine the word planet so that Pluto no longer qualifies. That's, that's actually a story for another day, what happened to Pluto. But there was basically a realization from the very beginning that Pluto didn't fit these patterns. And gradually it was discovered that Pluto is one of a very large collection of other objects that also don't fit these patterns that are found in orbits beyond Neptune, the so-called trans-Neptunian objects or sometimes Kuiper belt objects. Anyhow, setting aside that interesting case of Pluto, we have these eight planets that obey these three patterns. 
And these three patterns were known about for centuries, and they gradually gave rise to the modern theory of planet formation, which I now want to describe in a little bit of detail. So in that modern theory of planet formation, the planets formed shortly after the sun itself formed. And where stars come from are clouds of hydrogen and helium gas, like the one that's that's pictured here. That's Those are the most common elements in the universe. And if you look around the galaxy today, you still see lots of these undifferentiated clouds of hydrogen and helium gas. There's a little bit of heavier material sprinkled in. There's some dust. There are flecks of ice. But to first order, they are gas clouds. Now, what can happen is that because gravity is a force that is universally attractive, everything is always trying to attract everything else, gravity can cause this cloud to contract under its own gravity to, to become denser and, and smaller. And when that happens, the material that makes it down to the center becomes a very dense, hot sphere. That's the star. But it doesn't just all collapse down in one step. What happens is that if this initial cloud has any random sense of rotation to begin with, that rotation gets amplified during this contraction. And so you have a prolonged period of time when there's a star at the center, but it is surrounded by a sort of whirlpool of material, a disk that, uh, of material that gradually accretes onto the star. So you form a star along with this swirling disk. And this disk is sometimes called a protoplanetary disk because it is within that disk that the solid material comes together, sticks together to form larger and larger objects, eventually becoming the planets. So in this theory, how does this explain the three patterns of the solar system? Well, the first pattern was that the orbits are circular. Why are the orbits circular? It's because the disk was circular. On very general grounds, you can show that the collapse of one of these gas clouds will lead to a flat and circular disk. So the planets that form from the disk will also have circular orbits. Why are the orbits aligned with each other? It's because the disk was flat. The third pattern having to do with why are the gas giants far from the sun is a little harder to explain. But the basic gist of it is that Far from the sun, it's colder. And if it's colder, there's a lot more solid material available in the disk to form planets. Molecules like water and methane and ammonia beyond a certain distance from the sun were cold enough to freeze. And so you had a lot more solid material. Basically, you had more snow available out there to pack into your growing planet. And so that promotes the formation of larger and larger planets and allows for the formation of truly giant planets. So that in a, in a nutshell, in a skeleton form, is the theory of planet formation. And it's a great theory. It's based on fundamental physics like gravity and the thermodynamics of the gas that's going around. And it explains these three patterns that is the solar system. However, the true test of a theory is not whether it explains the facts that were known when the theory was invented, but rather whether it makes correct predictions. So one of the main reasons why we study exoplanets is to test this theory. And according to this theory, there's nothing special about the sun or the planets. And when we find exoplanets, we should see these same three patterns prevail in exoplanetary systems. The orbit should be circular, the orbit should be aligned with each other, and the rocky planets should be close, and the gas giant planets should be far away. Great. So how do you find a planet? How do you test this theory? What if I gave you, you know, a few million dollars and said, find me an exoplanet? What would you do? Well, you'd probably buy a telescope. <laughs> That's the first step. Then what do you do with the telescope? You might think, well, I'll buy a really good telescope that has a really high magnification. And I will point it at some nearby star, I pick a star in the sky, maybe, maybe this one. And if the telescope is really good, I'll be able to see that star. And if it's really good, and if there are planets going around that star, maybe I will be able to see them too. So in addition to seeing the star, I'll see the faint light from any nearby planets. 
And so then you go and you buy the telescope and you try it out. But on that first night, when you point it at a nearby star and, and make an image, you actually see this. It doesn't work. The glare from the star vastly overpowers any faint light from a nearby planet going around it. It's like trying to spot a firefly when someone is pointing a powerful spotlight right in your eyes. It basically doesn't work. So this very intuitive, direct method for detecting exoplanets is borderline impossible. It's not totally impossible. And there are actually a few dozen exoplanets that have been discovered this way with some pretty fancy technology. But that's not where most of our knowledge comes about exoplanets today. Most of our knowledge and most of the something like 6,000 exoplanets that have been discovered today come from a sneakier technique that I want to describe in some depth. And that technique is based on eclipses. So eclipses, I know, are familiar to all of you. Maybe somebody, some of you were even lucky enough to see the recent total solar eclipse that took place last April, or, or I've seen some other kind of eclipse. They are absolutely spectacular. The moon blocks the sun rim to rim. The sky goes dark. It's, it's amazing. Unforgettable. But that's not the kind of eclipse I'm talking about. I'm talking about a much, much more subtle type of eclipse that is represented here. So I'm showing here now a movie spanning about six hours on June 6th, 2012. That was the last time that the planet Venus, this little black circle here, moved directly in front of the sun. We call that a transit of Venus. They're quite rare. I think the next one is not until the year 2117, but they do happen and they are not spectacular. Like they're very interesting to an astronomer, but if you were just outside on that day and it was happening, you would never have noticed anything was unusual. You need to be told that it's happening. However, if you were monitoring the sun very precisely, you could have noticed it was happening because during those six hours, the sun got about 1% fainter simply because Venus was blocking about 1% of the light. So that's what gives us our way in to the exoplanetary systems. Even when the star is so far away, we have no hope of actually seeing the disk of the star or watching the silhouette of the planet go across it. We can tell that it's happening because the star appears to get fainter for a brief period of time. We have to rely on this coincidence that every now and then a planet's orbit will be oriented just so it's carried directly in front of the star that it's orbiting around. And in that case, we have a chance of detecting it. So one of the other things I wanna to do tonight is bring you very close to the data, very close to the actual source of our information. So let me now show you some real data for a so-called transiting exoplanet. Here it is. What we're looking at is a chart of brightness on the vertical axis against time on the horizontal axis, and the blue dots are measurements. So at first glance, it looks like nothing is happening, but then you see there are these little notches here that occur at regular intervals. Those are the transits or miniature eclipses by an exoplanet. We can get a better look at it if we restrict the range of our vertical axis to zoom in on these small brightness fluctuations. Okay, so let's do that. So now you see that on the vertical axis, we're now going from 0.985 of the usual brightness up to one. And every time the planet swings in front, bloop, we get a little blip, a, a brightness dip. Now, what can, we, what can we deduce from this type of data? Well, we see that it, the, whatever this planet is, it's blocking about 1.6% of the light from the star. And given what we, what we know about this kind of star, that allows us to calculate the size of the planet. Now, Jupiter going in front of the same star would block about 1%. So this is a planet that is evidently bigger than Jupiter. It happens to go by the name of WASP-12b. WASP stands for the Wide Angle Search for Planets. It's the name of the project that, whose data was used to discover this planet. So that's the first thing we can calculate is the size of the planet. The second thing we can calculate is how long it takes between transits. 
In this case, it's only 1.1 days. That means that this planet goes all the way around the star. It has, it has one full year, that is, one full revolution in only 1.1 Earth days. An incredibly tiny orbit. Right? Earth takes a year to go around. Even Mercury, the closest planet to the sun, takes 88 days to go around. This is a giant planet, bigger than Jupiter even, presumably made of hydrogen and helium, and it only takes 1.1 day to go around the star. So going back to our, our map of the solar system, if the sun had a planet, just like WASP-12b, where would it be on this map? Well, we wouldn't be able to put it on this map. We need to zoom way into the inner part of this map. So let's do that. So with one more click, now we're looking at the inner solar system. Here's the sun, Mercury, Venus, and Earth, and WASP-12b's orbit would look like that. So this was big surprise number one of exoplanet science, is that some gas giants have tiny orbits, really tiny orbits, even though the theory said very confidently you should only find giant planets very far from the star, just like we observe in our solar system. So that was the first indication that something was seriously missing from our theory of planet formation. Turns out about th these kinds of planets are not especially common. Um, about one out of 200 sun-like stars have a planet just like WASP-12b. It's an example of a so-called hot Jupiter. It's important to keep in mind, what we know about this planet is its size and its orbital period, the time it takes to go around. Everything else is calculation and reasonable physical inference. But if we give those numbers and we, we talk to an artist about those physical inferences, they can help us imagine what this planet might really look like. And that's what's shown in this slide here. This planet is so close to the star that the strong gravitational influence of the star on the planet probably really does distort it into a sort of egg-like shape that you see here. So these planets are very exotic and they also contradict our theory for planet formation, sort of pre-exoplanet theory for planet formation. Very interesting objects, these hot Jupiters. Now, surprise number two was that we sometimes see planets whose orbits look like this one. This is the orbit of a real planet called HD 80606b, as it would look if it existed around our sun. It's not even close to being a circle. It looks like the orbit of a comet, for those of you who know something about comets, but we don't, in our solar system, we certainly don't see planets with orbits that are so elongated as that. So that was surprise number two. Some gas giants have elliptical orbits, really elliptical orbits, not just moderately elliptical like we see in the solar system. The other funny thing about HT 80606b and planets like it is that their orbits are also strongly tilted. They are misaligned drastically with respect to the orbital plane of another planet in the system and with respect to the rotation of the star at the center. In the case of HD 80606b, it's misaligned by 45 degrees or some large angle like that. So those were the first big surprises of this field, were that these three patterns that we thought would be kind of universal and natural outcomes of the inevitable processes of, of gravitational collapse uh, turn out to have exceptions, lots of exceptions. Now, uh, returning to the data for a moment, we like to perform these brightness measurements with telescopes in space. Most of the thousands of known exoplanets were discovered with telescopes in space. And let me show you. One reason is that on the ground, it's kind of annoying for, uh, to deal with the Earth's atmosphere. The constantly changing humidity and pressure and temperature of the atmosphere corrupt our brightness measurements. They cause stars to to twinkle, basically, to fluctuate in brightness for reasons unrelated to the stars themselves. So that messes up the precision of our measurements. And the other reason is that on the ground, if you're stuck on the Earth's surface, every day the sun comes up <laughs> and you have to stop observing. Right? That's really annoying. If you want to detect these planetary transits, you have to monitor the stars very continuously. So let me show you a comparison. This is a data set uh, that shows 
the brightness versus time for a transiting planet as observed with a small telescope on the ground. This one's in Arizona. So you can clearly see that there's a dip that occurred at this particular time, but there's a lot of fluctuations in the brightness measurements. This is now the same planet as observed with a telescope of similar size, but in space, the Kepler Space Telescope. Which data set would you prefer if you were trying to make really accurate measurements of the brightnesses of stars? You know, you, the, the Space Telescope makes all the difference. Yeah, I want one of those. Yeah, that's hey, right. Can I interrupt with the uh, question here just to Please. set the precedent yeah. that we can interrupt with questions here? <laughs> So one thing I'm wondering is how do you distinguish a light curve like this from that of a variable star? How do I know this is a planet? Yeah, that's a good point because stars are not constant in brightness. The sun, for example, has dark spots on it. And as those spots rotate around with the sun, the brightness of the sun rises and falls. That's one of many different kinds of stellar variability. But fortunately, these transits are quite brief. You know, they only last a few hours. And then the star goes back to normal for days, months, years until the planet comes around again. So because they have that very sharp notch-like behavior, these transits, we can tell them apart from the other, other types of stellar variability. Not to say it's always easy, but at least the, the signals look different from the usual types of stellar variability. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions while we're lost here? Actually, one quick one for you. So you mentioned like uh, this; these things happen very briefly. So yeah. if the, if we're looking in an area and we don't see that brightness fall, but the pattern that you're given on Venus or whatever it was takes another hundred years to go, right. does that mean that we're missing stars in an area? Or how do how do Definitely. we accommodate for that? Yeah, the transit method is wonderful, and it is the main source of our knowledge about exoplanets. But it is inefficient most of the time. Planets don't transit, either because we're not looking at the right time, or their orbits are not perfectly aligned with our line of sight. And so the planet goes around the star, but it just never goes in front of it. So for example, if aliens were viewing the solar system from all different directions, only one out of 200 would ever see the Earth go in front of the sun. So the transit method usually doesn't work, but when it does work, it's spectacular. And it has there, by, by working in space, you can build a camera to monitor hundreds of thousands of stars all at the same time. And that's the way of overcoming the poor odds that any one star will show a transiting planet. You just have to monitor as many as possible, as continuously as possible. Okay, here's another data set. This is with a space telescope. Uh, this is with the Kepler telescope, in fact. And so you can see right away, we're dealing with very precise measurements. Here we see that the vertical axis is such that the, the changes are all happening in the fourth and fifth decimal places of the brightness. So here's a case where you can clearly see a dip here, and it goes down by 0. 0.006 in the relative brightness. That tells us that this is actually an Earth-sized planet, or at least not much larger than the Earth. And so it's a reasonable bet that this is a terrestrial, solid kind of planet. And the orbital period, the time between these dips, is 290 days. So that's kind of similar to the Earth's orbital period of 365 days. So that's very exciting because when we now we have two numbers that are more that that tell us that this planet is probably more like the Earth than most of the other exoplanets we know about. So we hand these two numbers to a space artist and they come back with something like this. Right? So if you read about this discovery, this is a planet called Kepler-22 in the newspaper, the newspaper almost certainly did not print this chart. Instead, they went with this picture, right? That's important to keep in mind what we actually know. Like when I think of Kepler-22, I think of the chart. But if you read about Kepler-22 in the, in the media, you will see it presented as though we can see the clouds in the atmosphere and the oceans and the continents. All of that at the moment is fantasy. So we know of thousands of planets, but for each one, the information we have is actually quite limited. It's usually just a few numbers like size, orbital distance, mass, maybe a few others. 
So our knowledge of exoplanets, although we're very proud of ourselves for making these detections, is still very limited. Okay, here's another uh, really interesting one. This is a system called Kepler-11. Again, we're looking at brightness versus time. In this case, the, the time axis ranges over a couple of months. And the dips look a little weird. Like They're not always going down by the same amount. And they're not periodic. They seem to be happening kind of randomly. Does anybody want to guess what's going on here? Why does this light curve look different from the others? More than one planet, maybe? Oh, Luke has a hand up. Yeah, go, go for ahead, it. Luke. Yeah, that was basically going to be my guess. It's either uh, more than one planet and they're in some sort of resonance, which is why you get the really deep dip on t at 26 days. Uh -huh. Or, or is this the one where they thought it was the alien megastructure, or if somebody thought it was, and that? Oh, I love that! Early? I love that star. But yeah, that's not this one. You were your first guess is correct. This is a multiple transiting system. So we have six known planets, each of which is transiting around, and each of them has a different size. That's why the dips have different depths, and each of them has its own period. So they're all transiting on different schedules. And if you only had the, that 40-day stretch of data, it would be pretty confusing. But this star was observed for four years straight by the Kepler mission. And so after a while, you can, you can tell what's happening. You can see that what you're looking at is the combination of six different periodic sequences of dips. The reason why this, this was so important is not only is that kind of cool to see lots of planets at once, but this kind of arrangement where you have six planets, all of whose orbits are very small. They would they have distances from the star that are all smaller than Venus's distance from the sun. This turns out to be pretty common. So that was what I consider to be big surprise number 4. Many stars have miniature planetary systems where you have 6, 7, even 8 planets, but they're all crammed in to what in our solar system would be the very innermost part. This was not really it, it certainly was not predicted in the theory of planet formation. It wasn't really ruled out either. It's just that nobody had thought about that possibility, which turns out to be common. If you pick a random star like the sun, there's at least one chance in three that it has a miniature planetary system like this, and possibly even higher than that. This might turn out to be the majority type of planetary system in the galaxy. It's not completely clear yet, but it's at least a third. Now, let's turn to some of my favorite uh, kind of strange uh, new exoplanets. So here's one where, again, we're looking at brightness versus time. And we see this dip here. And but then we look again, and, and you can see that, well, first of all, the dip here only goes down to uh, a very, the, the brightness dips are very small. And if you work out the numbers, this turns out to be, again, another planet similar in size to the Earth. So we're dealing with a rocky terrestrial type planet here. But there's two, two striking things. First of all, the time axis is now labeled in hours. So the time between these transits is only about eight and a half hours. This is even closer in than the hot Jupiters I was describing. If it had been much shorter in period, the planet would be destroyed by the star's gravitational field. So here we have a planet that is right on the verge of being destroyed. It's orbiting so close to the star. The other thing you probably noticed by now is there's a second dip here. It's weaker than, the, than these big dips, but it's clearly, it seems significant. So what is that all about? What we have to imagine is happening is this. So there's a planet going around the star very closely. And when the planet is in front of the star, that's when we get this transit. That's this dip here. Okay. But then... If we wait a little while, the planet continues its orbit. And at this phase, we're starting to see the very hot and brightly glowing day side of the planet. The side of the planet that's facing the star is being heated to thousands of degrees. And so it's glowing. And, and we're so far away that our telescopes are, are adding up the light from both the planet and the star. That's why we see this gradual rise in brightness. That's the illumination of the planet coming into view. And then we lose sight of that planet when it goes behind the star. That's this little notch that we see here. The second dip 
is the planet going behind the star. Okay. So this is pretty cool. We can measure the size of the planet from the transit, measure the size of the orbit from the period, and we can measure the temperature of the planet based on how much light is lost when the planet goes behind the star. So now we have these three numbers to give to our friends, the space artists. And this is what they give us in return. Okay? These are the so-called lava worlds because the calculated temperature that comes from these data is well above the melting point of all of the usual rocks and minerals that we have in the Earth's crust. So we certainly don't have any images like this uh, that give us direct evidence of lava. It is a very reasonable physical inference that the side of the planet facing the star really is covered by an ocean of lava. So this is the, the Mustafar type planet that I promised, you know, half an hour ago. <laughs> this, and, and these two, they're not very common. Um, they're just about as common as hot Jupiters. So one out of 200 stars like the sun seem to have a lava world. Now, what are they doing there? How did they form there? Did they, did they spiral inward somehow? Those are questions we just we don't have the answers to yet about the formation of these objects. Hey, you said the side that faces the star. Like, are, are these worlds tidally locked? Like, is it really just one side facing that star at all times? That we we don't have any direct observations that that is the case, but it is there's a strong theoretical presumption that when a planet is that close to a star it gets tidally locked, just like the moon is to the Earth. As, as many of you know, the reason we always see the same pattern of craters on the moon, even though the moon is rotating, is that the moon's rotation period is synchronized with its orbital period. And that happens whenever you have two bodies that are close enough to each other for the tidal gravity of one body to grab onto the other body and hold it in that, in that synchronized condition. And so if a planet gets too close to a star, the same thing should happen. So we don't have any way yet of confirming that directly, but that is expected to be the case. Thank you. Yeah, life on a tidally locked world would be an interesting topic too, but you're probably getting right. there. <laughs> yeah, one side is incredibly hot. The other side is always facing the empty coldness of space and cools down to you know thousands of degrees uh, lower in temperature. All right, here's another fun one. This one, again, we're looking at brightness as versus time, as usual. Um, but we see these dips here. They're very sharp, and they're very deep compared to the ones we saw before. So here we're going down from the usual brightness of 1 all the way down almost to 0.8. So something is blocking 20% of the light from the star. That's way too big to be a planet. And then we have this other one here that's blocking not quite as much, but still a lot of light. And it seems to alternate. So that's strange. And then if you look really closely over here, and we zoom in there, there is a little dip there. And that looks more like a planet, a planetary transit. So what is the story here? Is this a planet? And if so, why are there these two other kinds of dips that are much deeper in brightness? Well, the answer is, is wonderful. What we have here is a pair of stars eclipsing one another. We are off viewing this from the side. So we see a big dip when the red star goes in front of the yellow star, and a somewhat smaller dip when the yellow star goes in front of the red star. But then in addition, there is a planet, I'm following here with my cursor, whose orbit is looping around both stars at the same time. And whenever that planet goes in front, we see one of those really tiny dips. And if you have four continuous years of data, as we do for the star, you can work out that that is, that, that that is the only possibility that explains all of the features of the data. We have here a case of a circumbinary planet, a planet that goes around a pair of stars rather than a single star. Of course, the other nickname for this kind of, of star is a Tatooine-type planet. Um, and they don't seem to be especially rare. I mean, there, there are a lot of binary stars in the galaxy. Something like half of stars like the sun have a companion star. Our sun doesn't happen to have one, but they are very common. And as long as you are far enough away from that pair of stars for an orbit to be stable, you tend to find planets out there. So there, it, it, there are plenty of places in the galaxy 
where you could enjoy a double sunset. That much seems clear uh, from the data that we have. Okay, so I've shown how we can measure the, how we can deduce the existence of a planet. We can measure its size. We can measure the characteristics of its orbit. Sometimes we can even get the temperature and, and we can see the existence of other planets. That still leaves a lot of unanswered questions that we might have. For example, the Earth and Venus, they're basically the same size. Venus is a little bit smaller and their orbits are not too different either. So alien astronomers who were using the transit method to study the solar system, they detect Earth, they detect Venus, they would basically look like the same planet to them. They would look very, very similar. Of course, we know better. Venus is completely different from the Earth. It's much, much hotter. And the reason has all to do with Venus's atmosphere. Venus's atmosphere is something like 100 times as massive as the Earth's atmosphere. And it's almost all carbon dioxide. And that produces a smothering greenhouse effect. And that is the big reason why the Earth is this nice, comfortable place that we enjoy. And Venus is kind of like, a, well, it's like a literal hellhole. Like it's incredibly hot. It's something like 700 degrees on the surface. So if we're going to really learn about the conditions on exoplanets, and especially if we want to make progress on the quest or potentially habitable planets, planets where we might someday detect life, we're gonna to need to know something about those planets' atmospheres. So how do we do that? How do we take that step? The trick there is spectroscopy. Spectroscopy is a very general tool in both physics and astronomy in which we can study the characteristics of the light that is either being emitted by or absorbed by some substance and deduce the composition of that substance. What is it made of? What atoms, what molecules are inside of it? So for example, if you take a beam of light from the sun and you use a prism and you spread it out into a rainbow, it looks very beautiful. And then if you look very closely, you see that there are certain colors that are missing. Those are these dark lines in the rainbow. And each of those lines comes from a particular atom or ion in the sun's atmosphere, each atom or ion has its favorite wavelengths, favorite colors that it absorbs much more strongly than other colors. The reason has to do with the electron structures of the atoms and trying to explain that would be a big digression into quantum physics. And this is not the time or the place for that. But the point is that they're just very convenient. If you see in your spectrum of a star, a dark line with a wavelength of 589 nanometers, you know that there's some sodium between you and the light source that is absorbing that particular wavelength. That's spectroscopy. So the way we can apply that with a transiting planet is as follows. So you have a planet, it's in front of the star, it's blocking some of the light, great. But in addition to the solid part of the planet blocking light, the planet might have an atmosphere that is partially transparent. And if you view this event at a sort of arbitrary wavelength, like 580 nanometers, the planet and its atmosphere will block a certain amount of light. But if you tune your observations to a special wavelength, like 589 nanometers, and if this atmosphere has sodium in it, then at that wavelength, the planet will appear, the atmosphere goes dark. That sodium is now strongly absorbing. And so the planet and its atmosphere will block more light at this wavelength than it does at other wavelengths. So that's the game. You observe a transit at lots of different wavelengths. And if the planet appears bigger at a certain characteristic wavelength, you can deduce the existence of a certain atom in the atmosphere. It's called transit spectroscopy. And it is one of the things that the James Webb Space Telescope, our newest, best NASA Space Telescope, it's one of the things that it does especially well. Something like 20% of the observing time on the James Webb Space Telescope is being invested in the type of observation I just described, trying to study the atmospheres of exoplanets by observing transits at lots of different wavelengths all the way across the spectrum. So let me now show you some, some real data. 
Here is brightness against time as observed by the James Webb Space Telescope over the course of a few hours when a hot Jupiter planet called WASP-39 was passing in front of the star. So we see the starlight goes down by a little more than 2% during this event. This is as observed at a certain wavelength, 3,750 nanometers. At a neighboring wavelength, 4340, more light was blocked. This is easily seen from the difference between these two uh, different data sets, the red and the yellow. And that is because the atmosphere has carbon dioxide in it. Carbon dioxide is known to absorb strongly at this particular wavelength. So that is how the existence of carbon dioxide was deduced in the atmosphere of this exoplanet. Now, another way to, to present this data is like this. This is a different kind of chart. Now we don't have time on the horizontal axis, it's wavelength. We're dialing across the infrared spectrum, as it turns out. And the vertical axis is the percent of light that's being blocked at that wavelength. And we see that at this special wavelength here where carbon dioxide is absorptive, more light is blocked. Downward means more light is being blocked. So this is attributed to absorption by carbon dioxide. So that's pretty cool. That is how we learn about the atmospheres of exoplanets. And it is also potentially how we might one day make progress in this quest for life on other planets. It is one of the methods that we might use. Let me explain. Going back to the idea of alien astronomers viewing the solar system, if they were using the transit method to study the atmospheres of the planets in our solar system, and they had you know, much better data than we could obtain at the moment, they would study Mars and the Earth and Venus. And in all three cases, they would see extra absorption due to carbon dioxide. But only in the case of the Earth would they also see absorption due to ozone, which is a byproduct of all of the oxygen in our atmosphere. Earth is the only planet that has a lot of oxygen in its atmosphere. And why is that? It's because of all the plants and the algae and the other photosynthetic organisms that keep putting it there. Otherwise, left to its own, the oxygen is very reactive. It would get locked up as oxides in the Earth's crust and would be gone. So the thinking goes, if we find an exoplanet that has the same size and mass and roughly the same kind of orbit as the Earth does, and if we see it has oxygen in its atmosphere, well, maybe because there are exoplants, you know, there are photosynthetic type organisms on that exoplanet. So this is the so-called biosignature gas method for trying to detect evidence for life on exoplanets. I should say that we are not capable yet of the, the type of measurement I just described for planets as small as the Earth. The Webb Space Telescope can do planets as big as giant planets. It is even starting to be capable of probing the atmospheres of planets the size of Neptune. But even Neptune is four times the size of the Earth. And as the planet gets smaller, these signals get smaller. So we, this kind of observation for a truly Earth-like planet is probably out of reach, even with our newest space telescope. It might take an even more capable space telescope of the future. Yeah. Um, there's one more thing I wanted to share, um, and I, I, just because I think everybody, everybody should see this spectacular image that I'm going to show you. I said before that almost all of our knowledge and certainly all of the results I shared with you tonight are based on the transit method, the one that's based on eclipses. I said that it's basically borderline impossible to see a planet in an image. It's, it's like trying to see a firefly when someone is pointing a spotlight in your face. But I did say borderline impossible. It's not totally impossible. And the image I wanna show you is the one case that I find most spectacular where this direct imaging method has worked. This is the image I showed you uh, to, to emphasize the problem of the glare, that the star is 10 billion times brighter than the light that might be coming from some Earth-sized planet uh, going around it. This is actually a real image, though. It's an image of a star called HR8799. And I have some very clever colleagues, engineers, scientists, who build high-tech cameras that are capable 
of blocking out the light from the star and preventing it from reaching the detector while allowing the light from any fainter objects nearby to go through the path and reach the detector. These are called coronagraphs. They are uh, very finicky, very high precision technology. And uh, using a coronagraph, uh, my colleagues were able to make an image of this particular star after getting rid of the starlight. Okay, so with all that is built up, here we go, here's the image. So what we see here, the star should be here. We should see this glaring source of light, but it's been blotted out. Now it hasn't been blotted out perfectly. You can see there are these little eruptions of, of light here around the center. That's from the imperfect cancellation of the bright starlight. But in addition to that, and some other artifacts you can see here, there's this and that and that and that, and those are planets. And one of the ways we can be completely sure of that is this was, this was detected more than 15 years ago at this point. And so astronomers have been able to make a movie and simply watch as these planets start to complete their orbits around this nearby star. So this is the one and only case where we can really see multiple planets in an image going around a nearby star, very direct type of uh, characterization of the system. So if you want to look this up on your own, the, the code to remember is HR8799. I think everybody on Earth should be aware of this, uh, this pretty spectacular discovery. The reason that this worked in this one case is this is an unusual system where you have four really massive planets. These are each several times more massive than Jupiter, and they're all very far away from the star. And both of those things really help with the detection of these planets against the glare of the, uh, of the star. So we would someday like to do this kind of thing, but for Earth-like planets, to forget about all those tricks involving transits and just see the Earth or the Earth-like object around a nearby star in an image. We do not know how to do that yet. That is still very much a task for the future, but there is a big planning exercise going on at NASA to get serious about building not a successor to the James Webb Space Telescope, but the successor to the successor of the James Webb Space Telescope. So this is something like you know, 30 years off or something like that. It would be called the Habitable Worlds Observatory. It might turn out to be something like a really souped up version of the James Webb Space Telescope. So here it's pictured with an enormous segmented mirror and a giant shade to block any stray light from the sun and the planets and, and permit the darkest possible uh, conditions to make an image. And people have started to grapple with the engineering obstacles to building a telescope like that and simulating, just to get, get us our, ourselves uh, pumped up, what we might be able to do with such a telescope. So that's what I want to end with, is the simulated image of the, of a, of the solar system from 40 light years away with something like the Habitable Worlds Observatory. We would block out the light from the sun. We'd easily see Jupiter. We might be able to see Venus peeking out, but most exciting, we would be able to see the Earth as a so-called pale blue dot. So something to look forward to. It's still a ways off. Um, but it's very much, um, uh, it's in our hopes and dreams as exoplanet scientists to be able to reach that stage where we can explore the uh, planetary systems that, that are our neighbors in the galaxy. So I will end there and thank you for your attention. And I'll try to answer any questions that you might have. That is so cool. Thank you so much. I have many questions, but I want to make sure our members have a chance to ask theirs first. So uh, if you do have a question for Josh Wynn, please go ahead and unmute yourself and chime in. Oh, come on. I know you do. I had a couple, actually. Go for it, Luke. So one was about the um, HD 806, the one with the really eccentric orbit. Yes. You said it was uh, not aligned but not aligned with what are there other planets in that system that form a disk or form a plane yeah. like in ours? Very good question. So in that case, it is not aligned with the rotation of the central star. So in the oh, solar okay. system, the planets are all revolving in the same direction. And that's the same direction in which the sun is rotating. 
In the case of HD 80606, that's the only known planet in that system. So what we're comparing is the orbital plane of the planet and the equatorial plane of the star. Okay. And then my other question was about these miniature solar systems mm -hmm. and how common they are. And uh, the question is, is the apparent commonality of such systems, could that just be an artifact of the fact that those are by far the easiest to spot with this transit method? Because if you were to say, try to look at our solar system and find Jupiter, you'd have to stare for at least 12 years to even see it twice. Yeah, you're right that these the transit method and really all of our methods for finding exoplanets, they're very biased. Just because it's a very common type of known planet doesn't mean that it is an intrinsically common type of planet. Maybe it's just easy to find. The easiest to find planets of all are hot Jupiters. And so in the first, say, uh, I don't know, 10 years of exoplanetary science, most of the known planets were hot Jupiters, and many of them were, but they turn out to be very rare. So you have to make, you have to account for that. You have to kind of understand the method that you use to detect planets in order to perform the calculation of how intrinsically common they are. And it's only after doing that, that's that that I that you I, I mentioned that statistic that one third of sun-like stars have miniature solar systems, that's after making those corrections. So if you pick a random sun-like star, there's a maybe one in three chance it'll have these, these uh, miniature compact planetary systems. The other two thirds don't have any detectable planets, but that doesn't mean they don't have planets. It could be that they have planets that are just too far away from the star for our methods to be, to be uh, effective. So that's why there's a lot of uncertainty in these these statistics. Thanks, Luke. I, that's Thank exactly you. the question I was going to ask. By the way, spoken like a true oh. data scientist. So good. Um. I, I have a question. I don't know if it's a crazy one. Uh, <laughs> say that uh, an alien civilization has this capability, yeah. and that they were pointing at our solar system when the Earth was transiting, while the Hiroshima bomb went off wow okay what what would what could they use from that so um yes yeah, so that would be a very strange state of the atmosphere right where you have these radioactive particles that are that are being lofted all over the atmosphere so temporarily there might be some effect that could be detected in the spectrum due to absorption by really unusual atoms that are not usually in the in the atmosphere but could you deduce um, that 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 means that is sort of man made or civilization made or could it be a side, yeah. occurrence? I, I don't know how practical it would ever be to perform that experiment but if it if it were you know if you had some super duper telescope that could reveal the presence of um, these byproducts of nuclear fission in the atmosphere, that would be pretty strong evidence of something artificial, right? Because nuclear fission is actually quite rare in nature. I have read that there are certain mineral deposits in, in uh, I think it's in Gabon in Africa, that show evidence for natural nuclear fission having taken place in the geological past. But I think it's extremely rare. So... Likewise, I know people have written papers about trying to detect molecules in the atmosphere of an exoplanet that have to be artificial, like chlorofluorocarbons, you know, the, the molecules that, that we're trying to get rid of in our atmosphere because of the damage to the ozone layer. They're complicated enough. There's no probably no natural production pathway. So um, I don't know what the odds are of that ever working, but that's kind of along the same lines of the biosignature gas, try to use the composition of the atmosphere to make a case that there's something interesting going on on the surface of the planet. Thank you. Hey, we have a couple of uh, text-based questions here if you have a couple of minutes. Yeah. Uh, so John Pinto asks, can you talk a bit on how a planet like Earth has every element in the periodic table when most of the universe is just hydrogen and yeah. helium? Very good question. Yeah. So as it turns out, like most of the, the, the question questioner is correct. The, the most common element in the universe by far is hydrogen. Second most common is helium. Everything else is way down in abundance. 
compared to that. So the sun, for example, is only is 98% hydrogen and helium, 2% everything else. The reason is that um, it really goes all the way back to the Big Bang. The only elements that came into existence in the moments after the Big Bang were hydrogen and helium. The heavier elements had to be fused together out of hydrogen and helium. And there are only certain conditions in which that can ever happen. You need something very hot and very dense in order for nuclei to come together and fuse. And so one of the places that happens is inside stars. So the sun, for example, derives its power from fusing hydrogen into helium. In other more massive stars, helium gets fused together into carbon, and then carbon can fuse to form oxygen and heavier and heavier elements. And then when some of those stars, the most massive of them, explode as supernovae, they spread those heavy elements around the galaxy. So that's one example of how heavy elements are formed out of hydrogen and helium. There are a handful of others as well, like colliding neutron stars is, is a rather exotic one. So the basic answer is that it takes time and takes very special conditions to form those heavier elements. Thank you. And uh, Jeffrey Martin has a cool question. Uh, what about constructing an interferometer optical telescope at L1 or cis Jupiter space to actually see topographic or geologic features on exoplanets? Yeah, so yeah, you're asking, can we go, my, the image I showed at the end of my presentation that showed the earth as a pale blue dot, that's all very well, but can we zoom in even further and see topography and, and see the clouds and that kind of thing? That would definitely require um, technology way beyond what we can foresee at the moment, possibly an interferometer. For those of you who've never heard that term, that's a way of taking spatially separated telescopes, like a telescope here and a telescope on the moon, or telescopes that are spread around the solar system, and combining the light or combining the data in such a way as to achieve the angular sharpness of a much larger telescope, of a kind of solar system-sized telescope. We can, we, interferometers are, are um, they are, possible to build today, but not on the scale that would be required, that is not on a solar system scale, which is what would be required to resolve the details on, on a surface of a planet. So um, I'm pretty optimistic that I, or at least my children, will be alive and get to enjoy the first images of the Earth, of an Earth-like planet as a pale blue dot. I'm less sure whether, whether you know, how many generations in the future um, we'll have to go to to in order to see the continents and the clouds and the oceans on another planet. Very cool. Mm -hmm. I'm going to sneak in one of my stuff from my own questions if I could. Um, so a few months ago, we had Seth Shostak from the SETI Institute on, and we talked a lot about the Drake equation. Terrific. And throughout your uh, career, like we've discovered a lot of exoplanets. We've learned that they're fairly common, but yeah. not very many of them appear to be habitable. So What's your take on how these recent discoveries have changed the math on the Drake equation? Is it the same? Is it yeah. better? So it, I'm glad I'm glad the Drake equation might be uh, kind of like familiar to you. It's this, it's this product of terms that's supposed to tell you how many civilizations we can expect to communicate with in the galaxy, and so the it depends on how what the rate of formation of stars are and how many what what probability is that a star has a planet and what probability the planet is habitable and what probability the habitable planet has life and all of that kind of thing on it. Well, the when you multiply a bunch of terms like that, if even one of them is really, really uncertain, then the whole product is totally uncertain. So all we're doing now is pinning down one of those factors, which is the fraction of stars with planets and the fraction of those planets that are potentially habitable, those two terms, actually. That we're making progress on. Like we now know that planets are very common. Most sun-like stars probably have planets of some kind. And our working definition of potentially habitable is that the planet has to be not, not a giant. It has to probably have a solid surface. And it has to have roughly the right distance from the star for liquid water to be possible. So with that working definition, we know those planets are probably not that rare either. You know, it's at least 10%. Maybe it's as high as 30% of sun-like stars. Um, so that's definitely progress. But then what fraction of those planets develop life? And how often does life become intelligent? And how long do technological civilizations last? You know, 
your guess is as good as mine. We have no new information about any of that stuff. <laughs> so that means that when you multiply it all out, it's just as uncertain as it was before. Yeah. We don't know. It's the bottom line. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any more questions before we move on? All right. Well, yeah, if you guys want to learn more, do check out the little book of exoplanets. I got my copy here. It's a fine book, very well written, and uh, it's not so little. So if you want some more depth on this subject, there's much more to learn. So do explore that. Thank you so much for your time tonight, Josh Wynn. This is a great talk and uh, can't thank you enough. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. All right. Good night. Moving on. Um, share my screen again. That was cool. I have so many more questions I want to ask, but it's 805. Got to move on. Hey, we got uh, Mark Pernal up next to talk about our upcoming coming board elections. Um, so if you're interested in serving on the board and running for office, please do. We always welcome fresh faces and fresh ideas. So let me hand it off to Mark. Mark, I know you're there. Ah, thank there you. you go. Yeah, my MU wasn't working. And also, and I got a cat who wants to take over the, my <laughs> desk here. Okay. Cat for president. Yes. Okay, sure. Uh, there we go. Okay, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mark Purnell. I am one of your board members at large. And with elections coming up in October, I guess it also makes me your election supervisor. So to let you know, we actually have almost all except for one position is going to be up for election in October. So basically I have a list here. Uh, we've got the president, the vice president, treasurer, secretary, and my position, uh, the board member at large, number one. Uh, right now, we do have some people who have thrown their names in the hat. Frank is going to run again. Derek, uh, John Frank for treasurer, and myself for the uh the BMAL position. Uh, secretary, we've... Uh, Denise is currently secretary, but she might be running up on a term limit issue. So I'll let Frank discuss the technicality of what we may have to do in that situation. But bottom line is, if you want to get involved in this organization and you would like to join the board and help run us, uh, keep things going, get your input in, there's plenty of blank spaces up there. Just let me know. Drop me an email. Uh, my email address here at Cephas is bmall1, just like that right there, at cephas.org. And if you can't remember that, just go on our great new website, go to the membership page, scroll down to where the board members are at. You'll see my ugly picture and just click on the email link right there. Drop me a note, say, yes, I'm interested in such and such position. And maybe just quick notice you why you're interested. So... Feel free. We're looking forward to more people running and uh, let's make this a good election. And basically that's in a nutshell. Thank you, Mark. And yes, what Mark said, uh, we always want new fresh people on the board if we can. So if you're interested in any of those positions, do let Mark know. And uh, to talk a little bit more about the term limit issue. Uh, so yeah, Denise Woody has been our treasurer uh, for too long, according to our bylaws. So by the existing bylaws, she cannot run again. So I'm hoping that uh, one of you will be interested in stepping up for the secretary position. Um, it just means you need to be there for the board meetings, which happen once a month, and uh, keep a record of anything that we decided or anything that we committed to during that time and publish that in our monthly meeting minutes. Um, however, if nobody is interested in that position, uh, we're going to be in a tough spot, and we might find ourselves having to ask you to vote in our upcoming September meeting as to whether or not we want to amend our bylaws to remove that term limit provision. Um, what we've been tossing around as an idea is just of saying, instead of just abolishing term limits entirely, let's say that if we're in a situation like this, where nobody has stepped up for the position and the person that's in that position still wants to do it, let's go ahead and let them do that. So uh, do let us know. Oh, Will and Castro asks, are board meetings in person or virtual? Uh, mostly virtual, Bill. Um, you know, we're, we're spread out geographically pretty far, so that just works out logistically. Uh, once in a while, we do get together. Like uh, before the in-person meetings, we usually meet up for burgers and stuff. So um, it's a little bit of both, but the uh, the formal meetings are generally virtual. Of course, if someone uh, wants to run for president and uh, wants to change that, they can. But <laughs> uh, it's all up for debate. But yeah, right now they're virtual, Bill. Uh, but yeah, bullies. Um, 
Do you consider running and do you let Mark Pernal know BML1? Is it BML1 or BML2, Mark? BML1, right? Yes, one at cfast.org if you're interested in running for that position. Um, again, if we do not hear from anyone that wants to take the secretary chair, um, we will uh, have to do a vote in our September meeting. Not a big deal, but uh, you know, we'd rather not amend the binding laws if we don't have to, uh, because they tend to be pretty well thought out. Moving on. Thank you, Mark. Let me go back to my slides. With additional club news. So I mentioned briefly, we do have another in-person meeting coming up soon, which is awesome. September 14th, make sure you're there. Uh, we're going to be back in the planetarium again. So thank you, Derek Demeter, for opening up your house to us yet again. We have a couple of special artist guests coming up. Uh, Isabel got those for us. So that's be an interesting twist on it. Uh, a little bit of a astronomy themed art that we'll be showcasing in the planetarium dome. It's about as immersive as it can get. Also, Derek just came back from Berlin for a meeting for the uh, planet uh, planetarium society out there. And he'll be giving us a little bit of a trip report. He saw some cool stuff out there like the uh, home of Christopher Hugens, I think it was, and a couple of other cool spots out there as well. After the planetarium session, we'll do our breakout rooms again. And we do have one or two in mind, but uh, we want to get you guys involved. So um, if you are interested in hosting your own breakout room, let me know. Let our BMALs know. That's uh, John Pinto at bmal 2cfastorg or Mark Cornell at bmal one at cfast.org. Um, or just chime in on the group's IO. You know, if you got an idea for a breakout room, throw it out there and get some people together, whatever your passion is, whatever it is you want to get people together for. Um, we want these meetings to be a little bit more member-driven going forward instead of just, you know, me and Derek and everyone else on the board blathering. So uh, do step up if you want to get more involved and lead your own breakout room or lead your own little uh, mini program or presentation. Uh, we welcome involvement from the membership by all means. Also coming up, um, I have scheduled a narrowband image processing workshop via Doom, via Doom, Zoom. I hope it's not Doom. I hope it goes better than that. On Wednesday, September 18th at 7 p.m., I'm going to be walking you through using PixInsight to process pictures of nebulae. So that should be a fun time. Just like Wes Clem did one a few months ago for RGB images, um, or LRGB rather, I'm going to tackle narrowband. And um, after that, we'll have more astrophotographers showing off their skills. So if you want to learn more about image processing with PixInsight and narrowband imaging, do tune in for that. Also, next Tuesday, you might have saw the uh, announcement go out on Groups.io. Astronomy on Tap is back. So do check that out. Uh, and also, there is a forthcoming exhibit at the Orlando Museum of Art. Details are still in flux, but uh, coming soon, early 2025. Watch for that. Uh, we might be featuring some of the club's astrophotographers at the Orlando Museum of Art. How cool is that? So more on that soon. Also, um, speaking of changing the rules, we did recently change the, um, the rules around the loaner scope program. So we've expanded the terms for loaner scopes now, kind of taking into account that uh, the weather hasn't been too great lately. So maybe a month isn't enough time for someone to really have enough time to use one. The new terms are three months for standard members or six months checkout time for patron level members. So a little bit of an extra incentive there to sign up at the patron level when your membership comes up for renewal. Upcoming outreach events, um, it's summer, so not a whole lot going on, although school just did start again. So I expect this to pick back up shortly. And uh, for all those that participated at the Orlando Science Center's Science Night Live, uh, thank you. Um, that went well from what I hear. They sent a nice little thank you note to us. Uh, I think it was today, maybe yesterday. Coming up, though, not a whole lot on the calendar. A couple of things in November. Um, but if you do want to get involved in upcoming outreach events, do contact outreach at cfast.org. Or there is a subgroup on Groups.io uh, called Outreach of All Things. So feel free to join that subgroup if you want to get more involved and getting out there and showing people the night sky. Upcoming astronomical events. I really hope I'm really sharing my screen. I am, right? Okay, cool. Um, the Star Milky Way is still out. So if the clouds ever part, which is few and far between these days, um, there is some cool stuff up there to see. The D Dumbbell Nebula, Veil Nebula, Crescent Nebula, Lagoon Nebula, bunch of globs out there. I love I love me some globular cluster clusters. Uh, M14, M22, M15, M2, all positioned well this time of year. If the weather cooperates, keep your fingers crossed. Also, we're still waiting for T Corona Borealis to pop. They uh, say any day now it's going to go Nova. Hasn't happened yet, but um, we'll see soon. Let's see if we can actually predict these things or not. Another cool thing coming up on August 20th, uh, the almost full moon in Saturn will be just a quarter of a degree apart. So if you're looking for an astrophotography challenge, 
that'd be a good one. Uh, obviously, a huge difference in brightness there. You're not going to be able to do that in one shot, I don't think, but definitely a uh, opportunity for a composite of some sort there. Or maybe you have a fancy enough camera to pull it off. I don't know. Look forward to seeing what you guys come up with. And the big deal coming up in September, September 7th and 8th, Saturn will be at opposition. That means it's going to be at its brightest for the year there, and that's the best time to image it. So I know I'll be dragging out my planetary scope at that time and seeing what I can get. Also, uh, the rings are starting to get a little bit close to edge on to us. So this is going to be the last year uh, for another couple of years, at least, where you can actually get a good view of the rings. Next year, I think it is, they're going to be pretty much edge on, which is also kind of a cool thing, but less dramatic. So good chance to image or observe Saturn right now through early September. And with that, let's move on to our astrophotography showcase. Going to kick things off with Phil Rosenberg. Phil, I think I saw you online there. You want to talk about your exhibit at the Appleton Museum of Art? Speaking of art museums. All right. I am now officially unmuted. Yes. Um, So Ocala is home to this astoundingly cool art museum called the Appleton. It's unique in a number of ways. One is that the collection is owned by the College of Central Florida. And the building is beautiful and it's a partnership and there are thousands of kids that come and enjoy art and many more thousands of adults. So uh, apparently I was the low bid for uh, large vinyl reproductions of two of my astro images. And um, that's one of them my personal favorite, the rosette. In fact, every year, every February around Valentine's Day, I email the rosette to beautiful ladies in my life as a form of a Valentine's Day flower bunch. Um, And then the other one on the other side of the main staircase is the Seagull Nebula. Um, and I get to do this for a number of reasons. One is that I have one of the world's most amazing, patient, tolerant wives who has allowed me to act as though I was still 10 years old, looking up from my ratty tenement apartment building roof in New York, in Brooklyn, at a sky, and transfer that dream to having my own observatory. So I have a pro dome uh, on my uh, agricultural property in South Marion County called Weirsdale. Our property is called Sanctuary, which it really is. And uh, with a lot of help from my pal, Richard Wright, I have spectacular equipment living in that observatory, uh, a software BISC ME Pro, uh, ME2, and on top sits a 36 centimeter, 14 inch Raza. So the, uh, the camera, main camera is an EOS RA camera, and I can capture something like 90 images of the Seagull Nebula, while I'm in the house having cappuccino. And then uh, I'm told that it's all over and come down and deal with the uh, result of the processing. So out of all that comes a bunch of images that I enjoy sharing. So these are two of them. There are many more. And the idea is public outreach and creating circumstances in which little kids scream out, wow. And to uh, help make that happen, my beautiful wife and I have donated uh, 34 computerized robotic telescopes to middle schools and elementary schools. Everyone in Marion, um, Sumter, and Lake Counties has one of the telescopes we've done. And it comes with some training for the teachers and a solar filter. And uh, so that's what I do to uh, partly help me remain a 10-year-old at heart. (laughs) That's what it's all about. 
That's awesome. Yep. Outreach at its finest. Thank you so much. Cool. Thank you. Uh, hey, I just noticed Jeffrey Martin's here. Hey, uh, you're the guest at uh, Astronomy on Tap next week, aren't you? Do you want to uh, talk a little bit about that? Not to put you on the spot, but... <laughs> I'm trying to find my screen so you can see my mug there shot, you. but uh, I've been peeling around here and I lost my video. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm pleased that uh, they wanted to hear my my spiel on uh, Star Party Wow moments that we previously presented at Cephas. It was well received at the Brevard Club. Before it got too old, I thought I'd just try to milk as much as I can out of it. <laughs> and I'll also be talking about uh, Apollo 11.5 mock-up moon landing mission that I and three other 14-year-old uh, rocket boys uh, went into for 10 days on a sandlot here in Central Florida the same time the Apollo 11 mission took place in 1969. So this is the 55th anniversary of that event, and I'm happy to share our uh, miseries that we had in 10 days inside this capsule in the middle of summer. Uh, Love it. Simulating Apollo 11. That's right. So that's a uh, Tuesday at the Oviedo Brewing Company, right? Yes. Yes. Cool. Check it out, guys. Thank you. Our Thank you. So cool. Hey, Luke Corin. Speaking of planets eclipsing stars, well, it's not a planet, but it's a planetary body, kind of. I don't know. I'm mixing my metaphors. Luke, you want to talk about this image? Yes. This is a series of four pictures I took of the lunar occultation of Spica uh, exactly a month ago, as it turns out. And I didn't have a telescope or anything set up for it because the weather was looking not cooperative. And so this was just me standing in my front yard through haze and some thin clouds taking a picture with a 200 millimeter zoom lens and a DSLR. And I think I took, there's four frames in this uh, in this GIF and I took more pictures, but these were the only ones that were uh, passable in terms of quality and not obscured by a cloud or overexposure, things like that. I don't know why Spica, which is on the left is doing these weird changes in color. I think that's just because it was low on the horizon on a human night in the Florida summer, but you can see that it, you can see three frames of Spica with the moon moving closer and then the next frame it's gone. So I actually saw it and never photographed an occultation before. So there's my contribution to tonight. That's cool. Yeah. I'm also curious about why it turned green. I mean, you know, it's, it's not the atmosphere of the moon clearly. So that's uh that's bizarre. That's really cool. Thank you. Cal Beard, you. the mighty comet hunter. You've done some sea star cometary imaging. Are you here, Cal? I don't know if your audio is connected. All right. I know Cal's here, but I don't know if you have a mic. So I will just talk about this and pretend that I'm Cal. Um, <laughs> as you can see on the, the image here, it's a uh, comet 13P Olbers, magnitude seven or so viewed from Leesburg on August 6th. So well done. I did not know. I never even thought about imaging comets with a C star. Um, oh, oh, there you are. I think I heard you. No. Oh. oh. Now there's two of me. Okay, that's weird. Um, but yeah, it's kind of cool. Um, I don't know if the sea star can track on the comet versus the star field, but um, that would be cool. Uh, but thank you, Cal. And uh, yeah, there's a, a few comets, I think, heading our way this season. So always keep an eye on Sky and Telescope and other online sources to see what's heading our way. Always love us some comets. So thank you, Cal. Brock Rosser, you had a trip down under. You want to talk about that? Hey, thanks, for, uh, Frank. I appreciate it. So compared to what most of you guys have and ladies have, obviously this this isn't going to meet the standards, but it's something unique. And so we had the trip to uh, opportunity to go down there to Australia. It's, it's their wintertime, of course. And I only I couldn't take equipment. I would have loved to have taken a telescope. Uh, but this was just from the Samsung Galaxy at night. It's in the northeast part of Australia uh, near Port Douglas. The Bortle is about a three slash two. The skies were amazingly uh, crystal clear. You know, outside of their major cities, they have almost 
tons of darkness down there for the clear skies uh, or when there's clear skies. So this is actually from a, a roof uh, of a resort. And this is the Southern Cross, uh, which is very famous down there. Uh, but we can't see it up here, right? So at least just wanted to share that with everybody. Very cool. I've always wanted to see that. That's a bucket list thing for me. I was in Aruba once and thought I saw one of those stars, but never the whole thing. That's awesome. And by the way, in uh, Sky and Telescope this month, uh, they have a whole feature about Southern Hemisphere observing. And uh, also there's an article from our own Richard Wright in there as well on how to travel with your astrophotography equipment. So if you want some tips on how to fly with your telescope, uh, do check that out as well. John Pinto, what are we looking at? Hey, Frank. Um, so this is the uh, small Sagittarius uh, star cloud, uh, M24. And the reason I, I like this image is, first of all, it is from the sea star. And um, <clears throat> it illustrates a few things about our Milky Way that you may not really kind of think about when you're you know, looking at uh, the Milky Way uh, galaxy in our sky. And that is there are dust lanes um going through our our uh, our milky way and if we were you know an alien astronomer looking at the milky way galaxy um just like when we look at uh, andromeda galaxy we see dust lanes so we're sort of on the inside looking out and this is what dust lanes look like they look like this little dark patch uh in this image um if that dust if those dust lanes if those dust clouds were not there this entire image would be just filled with with stars, but you can see there's darker areas. Now, the background is the star field, right? So that's about ten to twelve thousand light years away. Um, so that means that these dust clouds are a little closer to us, so it blocks out the light. And there's another foreground object in here, uh, sort of in the top right corner, where it, you look like a uh, a a uh, tight cluster of stars that's actually another little uh, open cluster that's about mm, 9700 light years away so it's actually in front of that star cloud so i just enjoyed uh first of all that the sea star could capture this uh this is only a 10 minute image 10, 10 minutes of exposure uh, i did not retouch it i didn't uh, post process it in any way um so anybody who's interested in getting a sea star this is the kind of thing you can do, you know, on any clear night, um, you know, and and start learning about uh, the structure of, of our, you know, local universe here um, with, uh, you know, a fairly inexpensive telescope. Uh, I think right now Amazon is running a special of $450 for one of these. So it's just, it's just an amazing little tool for getting people interested in astronomy. And also very uh, good for being opportunistic about the rare clear nights that we have lately. So, yes, that yes. was one of the rare clear nights from a few nights ago. <laughs> I think we had one this past month, but who's exactly. counting? <laughs> I'm not bitter. All right, cool. Thank you, John. And another John, John Starr. John's been uh, photographing launches because, uh, you know, it's been cloudy at night. John, what are we looking at? Yeah, so... um that's right. So it's been pretty, it's, of course, this is clear, like how clear it looks, but trust me, it's been, it's been cloudy. It just so happened to be clear this evening. Um, so this, this shot was at uh, Tables Beach, which is uh, right across from Patrick Space Force Base. Um, and this shot um, was very, it was very windy and the waves were crashing. So um, this was, this is two exposures. This is a half second shot um, of the foreground, the beach there, and a four minute shot um, of the streak. And this was taken with a Canon EOS RA um, at 16 millimeter F20 um, at ISO 200 for the streak shot. And the the beach was taken, was a half second shot at F4 at um, ISO 6400. It was an absolutely beautiful night. The moon was high in the sky, the whole place was lit up and there wasn't a soul in sight. So it was really, really a, um, an amazing sort of sort of evening. But this was um, this is sort of my normal MO. Like when I take these streak shots, that's typically how I'll do it. I'll take two shots, one of the foreground and one of the streak shot. Um, the two shots after this are a bit more more complicated. Um, and so I'll, let's talk about the next one. So this shot um, is taken at the same place, same location. 
Um, this was a pretty interesting shot. This was not what I had intended at all. Um, this evening, I was actually um, heading down to the Merritt Island Wildlife um, Refuge and security grabbed me and or escorted me out of there. I've shot there before and I hadn't had any problems and I've seen lots of other photographers there and I hadn't had any problems, but for some reason uh, this evening, they were they were in no mood to accommodate me uh, shooting. So I had to hop in my car and I uh, drove 40 minutes or so down the beach and uh, ended up taking this one. It was a very, very hazy night. Um, you can see sort of the, the haze around the streak there and um, uh, around the moon and Jupiter. So in this shot, you can see the moon and Jupiter uh, off to the right there, um, a nice reflection on the water. Um, you can see the Pleiades uh, right above that, uh, which is cool. And this shot, because uh, it was in the morning, this was at 4.55 a.m., um, I did two four minute shots. Um, so I did a four minute shot for the for the streak there. And then uh, I'm sorry, not four minute, three minutes, sorry, three, three minutes shot for the streak and then a three minute shot for that sort of re entry there. And then I took um, a six second shot of the beach um, at, at uh, F5.6 F, uh, at 6400 ISO 6400. So here it wasn't very, um, it wasn't, uh, there wasn't a lot of wind. The ocean is relatively calm and I really wanted to capture that, uh, that sun sort of reflecting off the, the, um, uh, you know, the uh, rocket there, the uh, smoke there. So it, it ended up being a really beautiful, a beautiful shot, except for the haze in the sky, I think kind of blurred it a little bit. Well, it kind of adds it to it if you ask me. That's a that's a gorgeous shot. I hope that's on your wall. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I so these three shots. I didn't post any of these shots on social media. Um, okay. I think so. This shot is actually my favorite. Um, in this shot, there was a lot of planning. Uh, you can see the star field in that in this shot. Um, again, this is a composite shot. It's lots of images. So this is the the star field there. Um, I was trying to capture Andromeda, which you can see at the very top of the arch there. Um, it's a yep. little, it looks like a bright star, but it's right at the very top of the arch there. Um, and so, yeah, so this is, uh, seven, seven minutes shots on a star tracker, um, in, a, in order to capture Andromeda. And also on the top left, you can see Cassiopeia, uh, you can see the double cluster in Perseus off to the left there. Um, and then you can see sort of the open cluster Milan 20. Um, and so I was really thrilled with uh, the, am the amount of stars and stuff. I really wanted to sort of capture an HDR uh, type thing because it's so dark over there. You can see all kinds of stuff. So um, so that was the sky. Um, and then I took um, I took seven shots of the foreground and stacked them to reduce noise. Um, so the sort of the dock there and the water um, that it's, you know, with very short exposures, um, it's very noisy. So I, I took a bunch of shots there and stacked that. And then I did a single um, four minute shot uh, for the sh for the streak here. And so again, all these were taken with a Canon EOS RA, um, F18 ISO 100 for the, the streak, um, F4 ISO 400 um, for the stars and uh, F4 ISO 1600 for the foreground. And I used a move, shoot, move um, sort of nomad tracker, which is fantastic. I don't if anybody's thinking about buying one, I highly recommend it. They're great. They're portable um, and they they work absolutely fantastic. Um, so, yeah, so this is probably probably my favorite shot. Technically, it was the most difficult sort of to take. That's amazing. What was the location on that again? So this is um, Rotary Riverfront Park. Um, OK. So, yeah, so um, I people were looking at me kind of funny. You can see there's folks out on the dock and everything. And this was um, this was one in the morning. And I kind of um, so I after the parking lot, I walked through a bunch of weeds and down some rocks and over kind of over to a little beachy area. Um, I got some very strange looks, but so I set up, I set up there and, um, I set up three cameras and three tripods and, um, I took a lot, you know, I, was, I took a panorama and then I took my normal shot that, that looks similar to the, the first shot that we looked at. And then, and then I took this one, um, with, uh, the EORA. Um, so yeah, I had a lot of equipment that evening, but this one I did plan. I, cause I knew that Andromeda was going to be in the shot. So I spent a lot of time planning this one. Well, just. Thank you so much for sharing that, John. That's uh, amazing work. Very okay. cool. Isabel, what Hello. do we got? Hey. So uh, this is a picture that you might have seen at the last uh, meeting of M16 that I took in Canyonlands when um, I was there with my family on a road trip. I uh, teamed up with a local astronomer who 
scouted for us a location in the middle of Canyonlands that would be far away from Moab, the city, the closest city, so that we would get, you know, um, no light pollution at all. Uh, the location itself was absolutely amazing. We were literally in the middle of nowhere with, uh, we were there for golden hour and the sun going down and the light, the lighting on the red rocks formation. It was just magical. So this was taken by the Sea Star. It was about a, an hour and 15 minute of integration. I had 484 shots and then I figured, okay, um, I've been, I've been always tweaking my my images with Lightroom and just you know to work on the contrast and lights and but um, I was sort of afraid to start working with Pix Insight because it appeared like this Himalayan you know mountain that I would not be able to tackle and then uh, last week this week I don't know anymore I finally decided okay I I I got I gotta try I so I sat down I bought I. I bit the bullet because originally I installed the free version and I waited so long because I was scared to try it <laughs> that my free version expired. So I figured, okay, if I buy it, it's I'm going to have to use it. So I bought it. I bought a few other um, utilities um, because I, I started to watch videos and I spent days. But um, after a few days and my first try, this is the same shot out of the Sea Star, but with Pixit Sight. So I'm actually pretty stoked. I know it's not the best, you know, compared to what Frank does or or what we've seen, but compared to what comes out of the Sea Star, I think it's pretty cool to see that if you take all the subs from the Sea Star and you put in a Pixit Sight. Um, you can get something much better. Uh, and actually, I forgot to mention, but I also resample that image to see if it could be printed uh, twice. So it's 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 basically two hundred percent. So I'm sure I can get better than that. And I'm gonna watch your um, your workshop on narrowband. But now my other big fear is to tackle my big rig because I'm I still haven't been able to do that. Uh, I mean I'm. I know how to put put it out, but the plugging of the camera and that, you know, I have to I have to do it. So, but that I'm very happy with that. And and uh I'm glad that I can and if 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 anybody here has never tried Pix Insight and you're scared of trying because it feels like it's a mountain of um information that you have to learn and um just start with it and watch videos and so what I did though I ended up watching a bunch of different videos and then I wrote my 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 own script I mean uh, not yet in in the in the software but I opened a document and now I have my step by step and I can go and each time I find something that I want to add I put it there my next step will be to create my process in Pix inside so I can reuse it as a safe process to nebulae or, and then of course I'll have to learn for galaxies and it's just, it's the start, but I'm very happy about this start. Awesome. Awesome work. Yeah. I think we all have our own little cheat sheet for picks inside processes because there's more than one way to do it for every object. And, you know, I'm actually looking at a print on my own wall, the same exact object framed exactly the same way. And you got just as much detail as I did. So um, nicely done. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. That means a lot. And, and that is it. So thank you everyone for joining us again this month. And uh, we will see you in person on September 14th at the planetarium. Hope to see you all there. I'll be there. And again, if you have any ideas for any uh, breakout sessions you want to host, do chime in on groups IO, or just let me know directly. And if you want to run for the board or one of our open uh, board positions, please let Mark Pernal know at bmal1 at cfast.org. We need you. So do please step up and, uh, Get involved. You know, this club's all about you. All right, folks. Thanks again. And keep looking up. Uh, let's hope for some clear skies. And I'll see you exactly one month from now. Take care, guys. <laughs>